Well, it's a real treat to be here again. Um, and uh, this is, uh, well, a philosophy of science talk about um, why trust science. And here um, you see the team that I've been working with, uh, me, Jeremy Hardy, and Eleonora Montuski. And we're trying to write a book on the subject. Um, what I'm interested in is places where, um, where we trust science um, at the coal face, where it's really intersecting with what's happening in the concrete real world. I'm also interested in why we trust more abstract uh, practices, methods, and claims of science. But um, I have had my eyes operated on uh, <laughs> with a laser, and I really realized how much I was trusting science at that stage, and what you know, why should I do this? What, why is it a reasonable um, thing for me to be betting on it? And the answer is because uh, here are some of the standard answers um, that I think aren't sufficient. Okay? Uh, one of them is because of the scientific method. Okay? Another is because science is rigorous. Uh, third is science produces general truths by generalizing from well-tested results. And another is that science is objective. I actually got these. Um, I'm going to talk about science as rigorous. But I extracted these. There are a number of agencies, um, many of them in America, because you know there's the issue of what do we teach for science in the public schools, uh, in the state schools in America. And so there are a number of agencies that have tried to tackle the question of what counts as science. But there's also um, some legislation uh, about what counts as evidence for um, educational policies. So uh, a number of agencies, but also the American Physical Society and some places in Britain. So I scanned all of that. And I came up with this list, uh, which is what they say. Okay. Um, and um, as I say, I don't think that um, these are either singly or jointly sufficient to pick out um, why trust science. And one of the things I've realized in thinking about this issue is that um, it's incredibly difficult to come up with a demarcation criterion that sorts science from non-science. But it's a lot easier to give some account of what counts as credible science. And that'll do the job. It'll also do that job for. Um, in the US, what do you teach in school? Because after all, we don't want to be teaching non-credible science in, in school. So it's a little easier to tackle you know, what, what makes for credibility um, and sort of leaning towards what makes for credibility in science as opposed to theology or romance studies or uh, something like that. So th th I've decided to try and address the issue what makes for credible, trustworthy, uh, trust-deserving science. And um, I, think the, I think that's actually what these agencies were doing. I mean, they weren't just talking about what makes something scientific. I mean, maybe the scientific method, but um, uh, objectivity is something we cherish elsewhere. So here's a list, though, that I think is um, what I've extracted of the kinds of things people, other people have said uh, make for the trustworthiness of science. Um, I can talk about each of them but not in half an hour. So I'm going to talk about rigorous because it's one thing I've been writing a lot about lately. So rigorous results okay, um, are like, um, I think of them now as like diamonds. okay. So that uh, <laughs> if you want to make uh, a diamond, if you want to make a bracelet out of them, <laughs> right? uh, the bracelet doesn't just consist of those diamonds, right? Uh, the bracelet consists of lots and lots of other stuff that's been very craftily wound together, tangled together, built together, molded together by a, a community of jewelers who know how to do, this, have learned how to do this thing. Um, and uh, the uh, the rigorous results are like the little nuggets of diamonds that go into that. But the final product, like the credibility of the laser, um, uh, you know, the credibility that the laser is going to emit a cool beam and not burn my eyes, is um, based, I mean, it's like the end bracelet that we, uh, as scientists, mold 
out of using, among other things, rigorous results. So I want to um, mention uh, a, a story about high temperature superconductivity. So these are high temperature superconductors. And um, the story is told by Marilena de Bucchionico, who is a philosopher historian of science. And um, she, uh, very briefly, uh, there were two explanatory mechanisms on offer. This happened about uh, over a decade ago. But there were two explanatory mechanisms on offer about what makes for, what accounts for um, high temperature superconductivity. It turns out that the theory of what makes for low temperature superconductivity wasn't moving over to when you got superconductors at higher temperatures. So what are the two? There were two explanatory mechanisms. We don't care exactly what they are. It's the sort of structure of the study. There were phonons or magnetic modes. And there were two warring camps who were very, very good at what they do and very dedicated to these two alternative explanations. And then, um, so we're going to get a result, a rigorous result, which is like this diamond, right? Um, so there was a rigorous result. Um, they got some new 3D imaging. Um, and with the new ability to do this 3D in imaging, they discovered something called a kink, okay, a kink in the energy uh, curve. Um, and both sides agreed that these experiments rigorously showed a kink in the dispersion curve. So there was, you know, I mean, every, everyone, this is really, really, let's say, rigorously done experiment. And the fact that there's a kink in the dispersion curve um, is thought to have been fairly rigorously established. Okay. Um, so that's like our piece of diamond. Now, here's what Marilena says. Um, what's fascinating is that each of the two warring camps claim to account for the same evidence, that kink, right? They both claimed that that kink was in support of their theory and showed, refuted the other theory. So each took exactly the same diamond and with different jewelers and different additional materials, they <laughs> built that diamond in the two totally opposite uh, uh, opposing bracelets. Um, so I th that's just a nice illustration of how the rigorous result, right, it needs, it can be incorporated in exactly opposite, um, for exactly opposite conclusions when we want to do something more dramatic than just, you know, you're not ter ter probably terribly interested in a uh, kink in a dispersion curve, but I think we all will eventually need to be interested in high temperature superconductivity and getting it to work better for us. Uh, okay, so, um, so now remember, we had this list that uh, <coughs> um, science is credible because of these various things. Um, and the next thing I had just wanted to, this illustrates as well, I mean, I said I was going to focus on the rigors, but it, the, the little story also evidence shows that um, we, science doesn't produce general truths by generalizing from well-tested results. Generalizing, okay, so there you've got this kink, and you might generalize that if you ever do this experiment again on the same materials, you'll get a kink. Right? That's well, maybe you think of that as generalizing, but you can't generalize from the rigorous result to uh, either of these explanatory mechanisms. Uh, that is, again, takes all of this other material that itself then has to be found to be credible um, and so forth. Okay, so that's the, um, I'm not going to go about science as objective or the scientific method, but we could discuss those. Okay. So um, what more then, if we don't, if, it's, if I think that not, those are not um, separately sufficient, which is all I've talked about so far, but if, even piling them together, they're not enough uh, to account for credibility. We need, I think we need something more, um, and I'm not sure what, what I add is enough, right? But um, I think it's really important to pay attention to um, the community, uh, which is not news because uh, people doing science studies have talked about how science is a community activity, and philosophers have worked a lot on, in philosophers who do theory of knowledge, epistemology, have talked about how the, the locus of knowledge is not the individual, but the community that both gathers it and 
it can only be possessed by the community. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.